like for, to read for a moment in the book of Romans
beginning in the 8th chapter with the 15th verse. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage to fear again, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The reception that Paul's talking about here is the reception that we have when the Lord indwells us with his spirit. We receive it. And in my opinion, that means we passively receive it. The Lord gives his spirit. He seals with his spirit. Isn't that what Paul wrote in another place? You are sealed with the spirit. You're sealed with him. You receive him. And the spirit indwells you. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That's basically the same thing Paul is telling the Romans here. That now there's people out there that's going to attempt to bring you into bondage. Indeed, we sing a hymn, not too, or there is a hymn in the book, uh, not to bind or control the church of God below, here below. But there are people that want to do that. They want to bind us as individuals and as a church. Think with me for a minute of what happened as the Apostle Paul journeyed out from Antioch with Silas and with Barnabas, with Timothy with all, and all of his journeyings. What happened? He would go into an area and he would preach the gospel. He would go into the synagogues of the Jews first and preach there. And lo and behold, there would be believers and they would come out and they would begin to meet together as a church in that city, as a congregation, as an assembly. And what would Paul do? He would set them in order and he would move on to the next one. And then what happened? We have a profound record of that in the Galatians, don't we? Men would follow after him. In one place he says they were seeking to spy out our liberty in Christ. They would follow after him endeavoring to bring the saints into bondage. which is why Paul so vehemently opposed them and particularly, and humanly speaking, that was the reason for the writing of the epistle to the Galatians. But he mentions it in all the others, including this one. And he tells the, Rome, the church at Rome, you have not received the spirit of bondage to fear again. Let me ask you a question. How much fear is in you? I'm not talking about natural fear. I'm not talking about fear in what might befall you naturally. I'm talking about spiritual fear. Carnal fear, well, that comes and goes. That may be real, that may be not. I'm talking about spiritual fear. When we fear, If we're fearing anything other than the God that created heaven and earth 
and made all things therein and sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. If for any other thing we are fearing spiritually, it's wrong. You've not received the spirit of bondage to fear again. You feared once. What did you fear? You feared you weren't doing enough to put yourself in right standing with God, with what you believed God was. Does that make sense? Think with me for a minute of the Jews and the pagans in this time period. Those that worship the false gods and even those who worship the true and living God. They both had a system of sacrifices. One was vain and one was correct, but neither made the cometh there to perfect. And you had to have a little fear in you that you weren't doing enough, and you better get with it. You better do right, you better be right, etc., etc. But now you've received the Spirit of God. The spirit of the living God has come into you. And you're led by that spirit. And that spirit does not lead you to fear what, number one, it doesn't lead you to fear what man thinks of you. I think of the apostle Paul, uh, I've got to go back to the book of Galatians again just for a minute, where he talks about Peter coming down there and eating with the Gentiles. And, and just having a big old time with the churches of Galatia, enjoying it, till some came down from James who said you must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses as well as have Jesus. You've got to add something to the work of Jesus. And that something was what gendereth unto bondage and was not of the Spirit of God. And even Peter was carried away with their dissimulation and refused to eat with the Gentiles and hung out only with those that were Jews after the flesh because he feared the ones who had come from James. And he feared what would be said back there in Jerusalem about him. And Paul said he withstood him to his face. Let us not apologize for the belief that God has given us through the Spirit, for the doctrine that has been revealed to us by the Spirit. You know, we talk about uh, the Spirit of God being our teacher, and He is. John wrote it plainly. You needeth not that any man teach you, because the Spirit teaches you all things, Jesus said. I'm going to go away, and when I go away, the Comforter, the Spirit, will come, and He will teach you all things. So it will not lead us, the Spirit of God does not lead us to fear man. Jesus said to His disciples, He said, you know, the time's come when they're going to lead you before kings and councils and rulers. Don't premeditate what you're going to say. Spirit will give you what to say. Spirit will teach you at that time. Don't fear them that can kill the body, but fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So the spirit of bondage is a spirit that leads us to fear men and we fear what men think, we fear what men can do. And the spirit of bondage also leads us into a legalistic doctrine that says we must add something 
to the work of Christ to find ourselves blessed in this lifetime. And if we don't add something, if we don't do something in our flesh, if we don't do something to keep us going, then the Lord's going to come after you with a switch and chastise you. And that leads to bondage. All you have to do is look at the Armenian work-mongering churches of this day, and you'll see that one of their goals is to keep their members busy. Keep them busy. Keep them in bondage to the system. We are not led by the Spirit of God into the bondage of a system of works. We are not led by the Spirit of God into the bondage of a system of duty. We are not led by the Spirit of God into any kind of system that would chastise. not chastise, but that would make us The word I'm looking for is escaping me, but it's not that one. Thank you, brother. Um, that would make us acceptable to the world. You want to be acceptable to the world? Go out there and do something for it. You want to be acceptable in the world? Change your doctrine. That's what Andrew Fuller said, wasn't it? Back in the 1700s, he said that he had come to lift the Baptist out of the dunghill and set them on an equal footing with everybody else. Well, this people, the Lord said, shall dwell alone and not be numbered among the nations. Now, somebody may say, well, he said that to Israel. Yes, he did. But he said it as a type and a figure of his people who are in the world but not of it. And they're in the world and they're not of it because unlike the world, they possess the spirit of the living God, this which is not a spirit of bondage, but rather the spirit of adoption. We look at God not as a hard taskmaster who is sitting there waiting to beat us but we look at God, merciful, heavenly Father. The relationship has changed based upon the relationship that we have with our Savior. We were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. He was, we were given to Him by Almighty God. And we became His body, His seed, His bride then. And now, no longer should we consider Almighty God is a judge. But if we have his spirit within us, we are made to see him as our heavenly father who has begotten us again unto a living hope, who has begotten us again and given us a birth that brings forth Christ in us. And we can no more be in a spirit of bondage and a spirit of fear than Christ could when he was on this earth when we are given to see this and as I like to say when we're in our right mind which is the mind of Christ and notice what we have received enough of this spirit of bondage let me say this and then I'll get off it anytime anyone wants to set forth a systematic series of rules for the children of God, whether they are the Old Testament law or whether they're something they pieced together out of the New Testament and said, this is the way, walk ye in it, rejected out of hand because the just shall not live by sight, the just shall live by faith. And faith requires not the law, faith is totally and intrinsically opposite from the law. The law says do and live. 
Faith says live. Faith says live. You don't have to do anything to live. If you have the spirit of life in you, then you're alive. Isn't that Adam? The Lord formed Adam of the dust of the ground, it says, and breathed into his nostrils the breath or spirit. It's the same word in Hebrew. And he said he breathed into him the breath of life. And the man became a living soul. Adam became a living soul. He didn't give him a soul. He became one. And when we have new life given us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. And when we have his spirit, we have his life. That life wasn't for himself. That life was for his children. And that's us. And now we have received the spirit of adoption. And that's important. There are multitude upon multitude out there trying to teach you that you have been adopted into the family of God. You have not. Not yet. But you have received the spirit of adoption. That which is born of God did not need adopting. If it is the divine nature within you, if it is Christ in you, the hope of glory, it had no need to be adopted. But this old man, this man of the flesh, this man of sin, this one that's born of Adam, when Paul told the Corinthian church plainly, flesh and blood cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He meant every word of it. We have the spirit of adoption that this body will be changed. Be changed. That which is so natural will be raised spiritually. And it is now adopted into the kingdom of God. And we have the spirit of adoption that's witnessing with our spirit that we have a hope in Christ and a hope through grace that this mortal will put on immortality. And there's no bondage in that. It's nothing but the liberty of the children of God. The bondage is in the flesh. We are bound by sin and we are bound to sin. And we have a law in our members that Paul calls the law of sin and death. But God by his mercy in the death of Christ and by his blood has made us freed from that law by birthing in us a new man. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And that which is born of the Spirit has with it this spirit of adoption. And what do we cry? We'll cry. Oh Lord, don't judge me or judge me right or look at what I'm doing. We cry, Father, Father, be merciful. Father, I have needs. And the Lord knoweth what you have need of before you ask. You might cry out, Lord, I want. And he says, yes, you have want, but I know what you need. You're not going to get it. Because I am a good and a loving father. If our earthly fathers gave us good gifts, and somebody says, Father, Give me a bread. He's not going to give him a stone. Father, I'm hungry. Give me a fish. He's not going to give him a snake. How much more your heavenly Father is the giver 
of good gifts to his children, not because they've done good. My goodness gracious. You're doing good does not make you more of a child of God. You're doing bad does not make you less of a child of God. You're a child, and he's your father. And he gave you to Jesus. He gave you to Christ. Election is real. Election is personal. Election is particular. And the redemption that is in Christ Jesus is just as personal and just as particular. And the fatherhood of God is not universal any more than the atonement is. But the fatherhood of God is particular. And it's by this spirit of adoption. That's the only way we can cry, Abba, Father. We can't do it by nature, by Adamic nature. Oh, we might think we can. The old man likes to think he can do good. The old man likes to think. At least mine does. He likes to think he can do some things that, that be right good. God will look down on him and bless him. And when he does bad, I don't know about y'all, I think, oh Lord, he's going to rain down fire on me. But though I might deserve it after the flesh and deserve it after the sin, many times my loving Father blesses in spite of all that I do. Amen. In spite of myself. And in spite of yourself, because he is your father. This is a relationship that cannot be broken. And it's a relationship that will encompass all of you. Spirit, soul, and body. When this mortal does put on immortality. When this natural rises spiritual. And we see even and know even as we're known and we see him whom our soul loveth not just with the eye of faith but with these natural eyes that have been made spiritual brethren I, I tell you what we cry Abba Father and look at the next verse this same spirit beareth witness with our spirit. Beareth witness. How can it keep from it? If the Holy Spirit of God indwells his children and forms Christ in them, if that which is born of the Spirit is indeed Spirit, how can it not do anything else but witness with our spirit? That's like at the beginning of this book of Romans. He says he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. If you have the faith that comes from God, which is the, a, a gift of the Spirit. If you have the faith of Jesus Christ, which is what Paul says we live by, then that faith that's within you witnesses with the faith that's in the other children of God. The Spirit that is in you witnesses with the Spirit that is in all of God's children. That this is one. Or maybe that this isn't one. Most of the time we will give people the benefit of the doubt. 
At least I am because I fear that what I think is the Holy Spirit of God may be nothing but a delusion. That's fearful. It is to me anyway. To think that that which we believe is from God, of God's Spirit, turns out to be a mere delusion, something that we've got in our heads, but not in our hearts. We've learned well. We've had the wrong teacher. Spirit itself, the same Spirit, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if we be children, we are also heirs. Now the common King James Version says, and joint heirs with Christ. This is what the Geneva of 1599 says here. If we be children, we are also heirs. Even the heirs of God and heirs annexed with Christ. Here it's plain that it's by the union with Christ that we are heirs with him in his heirship. He is the one that's been established heir of all things. He is the one who, to whom God said, ask of me and I'll give thee the heathen for thy inheritance. We are heirs of God and we are heirs annexed with him. We have a twofold heirship and that's a beautiful thing. And then he qualifies it. If so be we suffer with him that we may also be glorified with him. For I count that the afflictions of this present time are not worthy of the glory which shall be revealed in us. That's what King James says. This one says, which shall be showed unto us. If we suffer with him. It is through much tribulation we must enter into the kingdom of God. It's not an easy road. The broad and wide path leadeth to destruction. The easy road is what uh, said in Proverbs, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. And then another proverb, it says the end thereof is the ways of destruction. It's given, Paul said, not only to, for you not only to believe on Christ, but also to suffer with him. I'm going to tell you what, brethren. There may come a time when the suffering for Christ becomes as real as it was in this time period. Paul in a few years will become a martyr for Christ. He'll give up his life for proclaiming Jesus is Lord. Not Caesar is Lord. Jesus is Lord. The kingdom is not a kingdom of this world. But the kingdom that matters is the spiritual kingdom that Jesus set up. Daniel prophesied it. Read it in the second chapter. If so be we suffer with him that we may also be glorified with him. For I reckon the sufferings of this present time. We have soul suffering. At least I do. The internal suffering of the saints of God 
is something that Well, you can't tell it except somebody that's experienced it, and then you don't need to tell them because they already know what you're going to say before you get it out. Can you imagine bodily suffering on top of that? But those that suffer with him will be glorified with him. There's a very real sense of the word in which we already suffered with him. If union of Christ be union with Christ be anything. And the words of the apostle Paul, if we were dead with him, we're raised with him. If the words that were paraphrased by the hymn writer, I believe it was John Kent, when he said, one in the tomb. One when he rose. Then we were also one with him in his sufferings. Because his sufferings was not for himself. His sufferings were for his children. And they were all in him then. That babe that lay in the manger. Bore all the sins of all of his children. They were laid on him. God made him to be sin who knew no sin. We suffered with him. And the servant is not greater than his Lord. And it may be that we are those who are, who would stand here after we're gone may be called to suffer. May they be blessed to our, and us too to count that the afflictions of this present time are not worthy of the glory. The glory will in so much more be revealed and encompass us than any of the sufferings that we have done, any of the sufferings that we have had, anything that God has brought us through. And know this, he is the one who is with us in the fire. He is the one who is with us in the deep waters. His hand is in ours and he leadeth us on. He leadeth me, David said, beside the still water. But he also found Jacob in a waste howling wilderness in a desert land and led him about in it. He led him about. When Solomon writes of the bride in the Song of Songs, the last chapter, I believe, he says, Who is this? that cometh forth from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved. Where else are you going to lean? And he's there for us, and he's there with us. He's given us his spirit. It's not a spirit of bondage. It's a spirit of adoption. It's his Holy Spirit, and it will reveal Christ to you. And it will bring you through everything. Look not to law. Look not to man's directions. But just as the apostle Paul wrote to the Hebrews, we are looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And we do that by his spirit that's been given to every one of the saints of God. And they're not going to look to the right nor to the left. They're not going to follow low here and low there. They're going to follow their Savior whithersoever he goeth. You know, in the book of Revelation, it says about the 144,000. It said, these are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. 
also in the Song of Solomon, in the earlier part of it. Oh, have you seen my beloved? It's the voice of the bride. Have you seen him? Go ye forth by the footsteps of the flock. Yeah, he's been here. You can find him. Go by the footsteps of the flock. Don't look out there amongst the goats. Don't look out there amongst the beasts of the field. Look at the footsteps of the flock. Why? Because the shepherd is leading them. The great shepherd. The good shepherd. The one who laid down his life for the sheep. Oh, brethren. This spirit that we have received, if we have truly received it, is all we need. And I pray it would be all that we would want as well. Now, I think I'm going to quit. I'll ask you to bow with me in dismission. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, go with us. We thank Thee that Thou hast given us Thy Word, which is truth. We thank Thee that Thou hast given us peace through Christ. And we pray that Thy Spirit would be made more and more manifest in us, that we might be blessed to, to rejoice, worship Thee, not just in truth, but in spirit as well. We pray that you would not leave us comfortless, that thou would keep us and that thou would bring us together again and that thou would humble us under thy mighty hand. Thou would continue to teach us in the way everlasting. Thou bless us as we return to our homes. Lord, we pray that you would give us peace and that thou would keep us in thy love. For it's in the blessed name of Jesus we ask. Amen.